Look, I'll admit that the path forward for Bernie Sanders, it's difficult. If he's going to be the nominee, we have a huge, huge amount of obstacles that we have to overcome. Um, maybe things can turn around at Sunday's debate. I don't know what's going to happen, but I will say that it's not over yet, and I'm going to be here fighting for Bernie Sanders until the end, until he decides to call it quits. With that being said, you know, predictably, people on MSNBC, the usual suspects, the ghouls that we have to listen to, uh, they're already willing to call it quits. And James Carville said on MSNBC that he's ready to just wrap this puppy up and end the primary. But we now have a party because James Carville is available to talk to us. <laughs> James, good evening. What are the voters saying tonight? What needs to happen right now? They are saying something very clearly. And my tip of a hat to Guy Fawkes. Remember, remember, this is all about November. These voters want to shut this thing down. I mean, you can just look all across the spectrum of the Democratic Party and people are saying, we made our decision. This is who we're going with. And Senator Sanders may not break threshold in Mississippi. He's at 15.3 right now. And we got to acknowledge that he created a movement. He, he did some, some, some truly remarkable things in American politics. And, and certainly Vice President Biden, we got to talk to him and, and discuss this. But we also, we can't, we can't diss these Democratic voters who are just coming out in, in every corner of this country saying, let's get on with this thing. Now, our mission as a party is to defeat Donald Trump. According to 538, there's a 99 to 1 chance that, that Vice President Biden is going to be the nominee. Let's shut this puppy down and let's move on and worry about November. This thing is decided. If you've ever watched The Righteous Gemstones on HBO, he sounds exactly like Baby Billy. <laughs> exactly like Baby Billy. Um, I hate James Carville. <laughs> This this individual, he, he's just insufferable, and it irritates me how um, Brian Williams was kissing his ass at the beginning, and MSNBC, like, they are obsessed with him. He's been coming on, like, once a week. Stop bringing him on. Like, do you want to actually have any younger viewers watch MSNBC? You can't bring on people like this who are just insufferable and wrong about everything. But he says, quote, voters want to shut this thing down. Um... I haven't voted yet. Like, my state doesn't vote until, uh, I think, May, Oregon. So, not everyone has spoken yet. And to say that voters want to shut this thing down, maybe some voters want to shut this thing down. Maybe they don't want a prolonged primary because they think that that will hurt the nominee going up against Donald Trump. But, I mean, like, to just say unequivocally, voters want to shut this thing down. I mean, you could have said that after Nevada when you were throwing a temper tantrum on MSNBC saying, hi, Putin. Remember that? You were acting like a fucking buffoon. So, I mean, we could say the same exact thing. And he's saying, look, according to 538, there's a 99 to 1 chance that Vice President Biden is going to be the nominee. Let's shut this puppy down and let's move on and worry about November. This thing is decided. Well, look, when 538 projected that Bernie Sanders was the favorite to win a plurality of delegates, if we said that, would you have been okay? More importantly, like if the roles were reversed and what we thought was going to happen before all the establishment candidates dropped out and endorsed Joe Biden, like if Bernie Sanders was in this predicament, would you be saying the same thing? No, you wouldn't because when it did seem like Bernie Sanders was the one who was going to be the nominee, we were thinking that we'd have to fight in Milwaukee because you all were openly talking about stealing it from Bernie Sanders. Everyone, including Elizabeth Warren, was talking about stealing the nomination from Bernie Sanders if he didn't get a majority. So, the thought that you would now say that, oh, voters want to wrap this thing up. Well, what if they selected Bernie Sanders? Would you still be saying that? Of course you wouldn't because you are a political hack. And you will always side with the Democratic Party establishment and have a different set of standards that you apply to us that will never be applicable to you and your side. So spare me. I hope Bernie Sanders stays in all the way until the convention, because guess what? Um, he has a lot of money. We've donated. We have poured hours and hours into this campaign, not to mention emotional energy. So for you to just dismiss us, 
I find that just deeply, deeply offensive. Now, you can kind of hear that he is pivoting a little bit, right? Because when you become the favorite, you've got to reach out and try to win over the other side. And Bernie Sanders has a very large movement, and Joe Biden knows he needs them to win. James Carville knows that too. So he said this, We got to acknowledge that Bernie created a movement. He did some truly remarkable things in American politics, and certainly Vice President Biden is going to have to talk to him and discuss this. Ah, see, see what he's doing now? This is incredibly patronizing. Now we're getting that pat on the head that we got in 2016. Remember when Obama endorsed Hillary Clinton? And in that same video, he said, and I also want to, you know, send a special message to Bernie Sanders and his supporters. Like I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember what he said, but it felt very patronizing and condescending in a way because we know that you all fought us at every step of the way. So what you're saying now, telling us everything that we've achieved, like it, it's meaningless because we know if the roles were reversed, you would absolutely be throwing a temper tantrum right now. So you're trying to win us over after you all showed your asses when Bernie Sanders was the presumptive nominee? Fuck out of here. Like, this is the problem with these types of people, these types of elites, democratic strategists. Like, they don't actually listen to normal voters. Like, he doesn't realize, like, it, it's not as easy as just trying to dangle some policy concession in front of Bernie Sanders supporters. Voter apathy is a bigger issue than anyone in mainstream media realizes. Like people that I talk to, if Bernie is in the nominee, they're not voting. They're not voting. So for me as an individual, my next step is to convince them to come out and vote because they can support Democrats down the ticket. So, I mean, they don't realize, like they're, they're so misguided and they fundamentally misunderstand what normal voters deal with because they don't talk to normal voters they don't talk to normal people this dude have you seen the mansion that he lives in it looks like a disgusting victorian dollhouse it looks like the ugliest dollhouse i have ever seen it's gratuitous so i mean like these people they live in you know their bubbles they look down at us you know from their ivory towers and judge us and scoff at us and they expect us to be happy with the crumbs that they're offering us, but now when it's time to reach out to us, you know, it, you see the little half-assed attempts that they make and the patro them just being, you know, patronizing. It's just, I'm so sick of it. So, um, if, if Joe Biden actually wants to win over Bernie Sanders supporters, you're going to have to pick a very, very left-wing VP, still won't win over all of them, and you're going to have to actually make real policy concessions, not just say, well, I support, you know, a means-tested version of Medicare for All or whatever. Like, there's a chance that you just can't win them over because they're going to stay home. But if you actually want to win and uh, really win back the Democratic Party voters who, you know, elites drove away, we need policy concessions in the form of policies being passed and codified into law. Like, we're talking not just policy concessions in the sense that you agree to support Medicare for All if you're elected. Like, we need you to pass it and give us the health care. That's where we're at now. Because anyone who is younger than 45 years old, they've been turned off by the Democratic Party establishment, by the Obamas, by the Hillary Clintons, by the Joe Bidens, by the Mike Bloombergs now of the world. And James Carville can never understand that because he lives in a mansion. He's rich. So, you know, he's never going to have to really worry about, you know, the consequences of a Republican administration. Because he's protected, he's fine, he has money. He'll never have to worry about a medical bankruptcy. He'll never have to worry about dying because he doesn't have health insurance. He'll never have to worry about getting his student loans paid for or putting food on the table because he's rich. And, you know, rather than rich splaining, if Democratic Party strategists actually wanted to win, I'm not convinced that they do, you would talk to normal people and not just talk at us and talk amongst yourselves on MSNBC. That's where you start. Beta male, not a beta male.